Hi, my name is Naomi Black. I'm a member of the accessibility engineering team at Google, and I work on captioning for YouTube, and I also work on accessibility for the blind. Hi, I'm Cynthia Budiharjo. I'm a live stream program manager at Google, and I work on different types of live streams from concerts to this year's Google I.O. And I'm Jeff Posnick, and I'm a member of the YouTube API developer relations team at Google. So before we get started, I want to point out the hashtags if you feel the need to tweet during our talk, uh, IO2011 and YouTube. There's a link for feedback, and if you want to talk to us afterwards about captioning and stuff related to this talk, send an email to captioning at google.com and it will reach us. So I thought I'd start by giving you an overview of what we're going to talk about in our talk. I'm going to start by introducing the captioning that we did here at IO Live, which was uh, streamed from the conference, and talk about that a little bit. And Cynthia will talk to you about how the gadget was created and what that involved. And then we will talk about WebVTT, which is a new time text format for HTML5 that lets us do some cool things. And we'll show you some demos in WebKit and some code. And uh, then Jeff will talk about the YouTube Caption API, and there will be more code and demos. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about why captions are important to us. Um, this chart, which you, you can't read it, just notice that there are bars, and some of them are larger <laughs> than the others. Um, <laughs> the really long bars, so these are um, the world population on the internet, roughly, by country. And at the top, we have China. There's lots of Chinese. And then there's the United States, and it goes down the list. And you can see there's some yellow bars. And the first yellow bar represents the number of deaf and hard of hearing people in the United States alone. And so that number, I like to throw this up because I'm Canadian, um, that's more than the population of Canada that's online. So, you know, nobody would say, oh, well, let's not, you know, let's not broadcast this to the Canadians. They could care less. But sometimes when we put video online, if it doesn't have captions, you're excluding a population that's actually larger than that. So I like to throw this graph up to really show you the numbers. So we caption our videos for accessibility reasons, obviously, but um, captions and time text are actually really powerful for the web because video is really hard to search. But when you caption your video, the full text of that video, if you upload captions to YouTube, that full text becomes searchable. So you can actually search inside your video on something that was said at minute 30 that may not be in your talk description or your title. Um, caption video, because the captions are text, we can do cool things with it. We can change the size. We can translate the captions using machine translation. And our audience on the internet doesn't necessarily speak our language. We really, we want to reach the world. So captions are helpful for translation. And finally, there's a lot of people who use same language subtitling. They may be learning your language. And so having the text underneath the speaker helps them follow an accent that's unfamiliar or somebody who's speaking faster than they're used to. And I'd like to show this picture. This was taken at a conference that we had uh, in France recently called Atmosphere. And this was CIOs and CTOs and business people that nobody was wearing a t-shirt. And um, they, they all met in France, but they spoke English. And very few of the attendees had English as a first language, but it was the common language that everybody came to do business in. And so to help our attendees, even though there was nobody at this conference who was deaf or hard of hearing, as far as I know, we presented the text on screen and in all of the talks behind the speaker so that everybody who was coming together and using this language that was unfamiliar to them would have the assistance of the text. You think about developers in Japan, they're very used to reading English, but maybe not as used to hearing it spoken, especially for technical terms. So these captions really help everyone. So at I.O. this year, we have live captions. We actually had live captions last year, but this year we decided to go a step further with the huge interest in I.O. Live for the streaming video. We really wanted to accompany um, the video with captions and make those available not just here at I.O., but for the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that involved. Um, the first thing I need to tell people is that captions are done by people. <laughs> I mean, not all captions. We have automatic captions on YouTube. But the kinds of captions that you're seeing here at I.O. where they're popping up on screen several hundred words a minute, um, we don't have computers that are fast and accurate enough to do that. And so we rely on highly skilled people who are um, typing on special stenography rig, and that allows them to go several hundred words a minute very accurately. And that then goes out to the screen on the show floor. and <coughs> Uh, in this case, you can see Laura. She's one of our transcriptionists. This picture was actually taken in the first keynote, and she's typing away on her rig, and that's sending the captions out. B 
Beyond the show floor, we send them by TCP IP, and they go out through a service, in this case provided by a company called StreamText, and they have a .NET connector, and they, they provide this streaming service for accessibility to the web. Well, when we came to them and we wanted to do this for I.O., we realized we were going to have a lot of people watching this caption gadget, and so we wanted to really host it on App Engine for scalability. So I went to Cynthia, and um, Cynthia's going to talk about what was involved. Thanks, Jeremy. So I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with what's going on with YouTube, but there have been a lot of requests for live streaming events. So as of early April, we actually launched youtube.com slash live, which will show you a whole bunch of different live events that our YouTube partners are hosting. Um, with the live events, some of them kind of include product launches, concerts like John Legend and concert, sporting events like IPL, which you know, garners like 50 million views um, as of last year. And then, of course, this year's Google I.O. As of um, the increase of live events come on YouTube, we've noticed that some of these events include these informational talks and where there's a lot of speech that's, been, that's going on. And we have a lot of non-English viewers as well as, um, you know, just people who might not really be able to understand somebody speaking very, very, um, very fast. So what we wanted to do was create a gadget that not only had the captions underneath the live player, but had the ability to also translate in real time. So what we did was, in order to build the caption gadget, we contracted the help of Cycle Interactive, which is this UK company, an ind independent production house that we've worked with uh, on YouTube many times, as well as StreamText, which is a real-time um, streaming text provider. For the gadget, our requirements were pretty simple. One, we wanted to take the real-time text from stream text and feed it into the gadget. Two, translate it in real time in multiple languages and use the Google Translate API. And of course, make the code open source, which means not only can you use this on YouTube live events if you're a partner, um, but you can also use this for other you know, live, um, live events that you may be doing on other sites, or even if you wanted to do it, use it for something else, um, you could essentially just take that code. So I don't know if you guys have been able to see what the gadget actually looks like, but let me just show you. It's on the website, um, the Google I.O. homepage. Um, let me just, stand yeah, let me just make sure it's muted here. But essentially, what it does is it takes in a, a real-time feed from stream text. So the ladies who are actually transcribing takes, takes in what's coming in from the stage. And because usually during a live stream there's a five to 10 second delay, we added a feature in the gadget to um, add a delay depending on like if you're doing just one event, maybe the speaker speaks super fast. You might want to put a one second delay in there versus like a two second. Right now we have like a two second delay on all of our um, on all of our streams. But essentially, the features that we added in here were the ability to take in that real-time text. Um, it's all hosted on App Engine, so we actually had to make a special request and have the App Engine team provision um, you know, a, a lot of bandwidth for us so that we can um, take in all these requests from users. And I'll, I'll share some stats with you later on today. And with um, Google Translate, we have the ability to translate this into 57 languages. So let me just demo, um, let's do Croatian. What it does, it takes a bit of, a couple of seconds and then it'll translate to Croatian super fast. So what it does is usually for the English translation, it's word for word, but because we wanted Google Translate to translate the context of the actual speech, we wait 35 characters. I don't know if anybody here speaks Croatian, but. <laughs> I saw somebody actually tweeted that they, they were watching it in Hindi. Oh, cool. I, I don't speak Hindi, but they tweeted about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> so um, those are some of the features we had. So some of the technical challenges were, you know, how are we going to handle the viewership? App Engine um, helped us with that, as well as that delay that I had, I had mentioned. Here's some stats that we got from just yesterday. Uh, Vic had mentioned, you know, there was 600 uh, viewers to the stream. There was actually 250 viewers to that captioning gadget itself. 250,000 viewers. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I like to shorten things. 
Um, the top five countries, or the type, top five languages people selected were English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Russian. And then out of the 57 languages that Google Translate had the ability to translate into, 52 languages were actually selected, which is kind of an amazing number. So you're probably wondering if you wanted to use this gadget, how to go about doing that. We made the code available. We'll make this PDF um, open to, to you guys after the session. So just follow that link for Google Code and you can get it there. As well, if you are a YouTube partner, um, especially a live partner, go ahead and speak to your Google or YouTube rep and uh, you can ask them how to go about using this for your next event. I'll go back to Naomi and she can talk to you about WebVTT. Thanks, Cynthia. So we've been talking about captioning, but you notice on this slide I've changed the term to timed text. And so I'm going to explain to you why we're not just talking about captioning anymore. So timed text encompasses much more than just captioning. It encompasses any use of text that's useful for video where there's a time component that's important to us. So people who are hard of hearing or deaf they're going to need captions to understand the context of the video. But people who are blind are also using a form of timed text called audio description. And traditional audio description, if you go look on YouTube, actually, there's a talk on WebVTT that we gave a few weeks ago. And you can find there's an audio description version. So audio description is the process of creating a new script for a video that includes all of the visual elements that somebody who's blind might not have available to them. So you might think about taking something like this talk and putting it online. Well, a blind user can listen to everything they're saying, so they must be getting everything, right? But they're not going to get that slide that I put up with the bars that actually none of you could see either. But they wouldn't be able to see <laughs> Cynthia's talk and the part of her demo. And so what audio description does is it provides this information in a script that's written out and the script has time cues and says at this moment, describe, you know, the slide on screen shows a pie chart and, you know, and so on. So audio description is useful for blind users and it has a text and a time component. Um, you can use synchronization for music lyrics, you can do your own karaoke, and uh, navigation is very helpful. You think about what we're able to do today on our DVD players where you can just cue ahead through chapters. It would be great if you could do that on YouTube and just say, oh, you know, I want to jump ahead to the more interesting part of this talk. So HTML5 has a text-based solution for all of these. It's called, uh, well, actually, <clears throat> HTML5 under the, the video element has a, a track element that accommodates time text. HTML5 doesn't recommend a particular format. You can support any format that you like. And so in this case, we're proposing a format called WebVTT. And I'm going to show you some demos in WebKit that show that support. So here's an example file in the WebVTT format. And um, in WebVTT, we have things that we'll call queues. And so a queue is basically some text that has a start time and an end time. So in this case, you can see there's a start time point, and then there's an end time point. And then below it, there's some text that is appearing on screen between those two time points. And you can see that we've marked this up with simple HTML styling. We have support for italics and bold and underline. Um, and so then the next line, I've actually got, you have positioning that we can specify as well. So I can say T percentage 60%. And if you look, the center line of the captions on it, it's a little hard to see, but the, the captions, the center line are a little off from the center. We've, we've positioned them over to the side. Um, and we can set a line position as well. So I can very accurately, using WebVTT, pinpoint exactly where on the screen I want that text to appear. And that's useful. If you watch captions on TV, you'll see that people use text positioning to identify sometimes who is speaking. So you have two people speaking. The captions appear on the left. You know it's that person who's speaking. The person on the right speaks. The captions move. Today, if you look at YouTube, we don't have that capability. And so um, we're looking ahead at the web. We want the web to offer everything that our TV captions do, maybe even more. And so positioning is a really important part of that. So here's another WebVTT example file. Um, because WebVTT is on the web, we really want to use the richness of CSS and HTML. And so in this case, I've defined a pseudo element inside my queue. I have c.arduino. And you can see the CSS for my page then specifies how that Arduino queue should be styled. And so I've set the color to be red and the text to be uppercase. And this is really interesting to me. One of my responsibilities at Google is making sure that our content is captioned. And I speak to a lot of YouTube partners. And we see more and more TV content that's moving to the web. Well, 
if I'm watching Doctor Who in Britain, I'm going to see my captions according to UK caption standards. So individual speakers will have their text styled in different colors. So whenever I see blue text, maybe that's the doctor speaking. And I would just recognize and expect that. But here in the United States, we're used to seeing our captions all in the same color, and they're styled a little bit differently. So currently what happens, if I'm the BBC and I want to provide that video file, I have to make my caption file twice. I have to make it once for the UK styling and once for the American styling, and again for any other region that I'm distributing to that has a different look and feel for captions. But with CSS, you could see how I could create a single caption file that marks things up semantically, and then I could use CSS on my web page to style it differently depending on who's watching it. I'm going to gloss over this slide pretty quickly. I just want to indicate this is allowing us to do um, Chinese and Japanese characters. We have full UTF-8 support in WebVTT. So unlike many broadcast formats where the text has to be rasterized to represent double byte, in this case, it just stays as text within the file. And because it stays as text, we can translate that text, and we can search on that text. And for the web, that's really important. So here's an example of the, the caption the type of captions that, sorry, let me step back. Here's an example of the video element um, in HTML5. So I've been talking about the format. Let me tell you a little bit more about how you would represent this in HTML5. So the video element in HTML5 says, okay, here's my video element, and then underneath it I have a source element for the video file, and that tells me where to find the video that I'm gonna play. And then I have a bunch of track elements. And these track elements here, you'll notice I have two different types of tracks. I have a captions track and I have a subtitle track. And so the subtitle track, that would be just the text. Like if you're watching a French movie and you see just the text that's appearing, it doesn't represent any of the noises or the background sounds that a user who's deaf might be relying on. Whereas captions include often in square brackets things like laughter or applause. So we have two different kinds. We have captions and subtitles. And when I set the kind to be caption or subtitle, what happens in the player is the player then says, oh, this is for me. I should display this as text, as captions on screen. So I'm going to show you a demo of that. So what I'm running here is Chromium. And I have, um, I have a very new build of Chromium. We, we literally got the first implementation support of some of these things in last week. So if you install Chromium today, you won't see this. But we're hoping by the time we've unit tested everything and, and we've checked everything and, and, and made sure that it's really solid, um, hopefully by the end of the summer or early fall, you'll be able to see these as well. And because these things are going to be baked into WebKit, um, they'll be available in any browser that supports WebKit. So you as the video provider, you don't have to create a new player every time you want to include a video and make it accessible. Okay. So here I am in Chromium. I'm going to play my video. Can we turn the sound on? All right. Can we turn the sound down a bit? <laughs> okay. That was a little scary. Let me go again. Uh, so I just wanted to... So here we have, he's speaking, there's text underneath, you can see it's styled with italics. And I can change the caption language here with the selector. This selector is using JavaScript, but eventually this feature would be built into the player. So let's make them German. Introduce you to W3C and... And this is not machine translation here, let me show you the index file. Uh, here's the index file. Okay, so here you see this is the same thing that I showed you on my slide. We have a video track, we have the source, with the video element, we have the source element, and then here we have two track elements, one for English and one for German. And that's what I'm playing here in my video in the demo. So let me show you what the WebVTT looks like. And just to prove to you that I'm really doing this live, I'm going to make a change to it. So I'm going to open this with TextMate. So this is really simple, right? I'm editing this in a text editor. I don't, I don't need a fancy tool, although if I'm doing lots of these, a fancy tool might be helpful. I can just go in any text editor, and here I'm going to change these italics to be underlined. And I'm going to save my file. I'm going to go back and reload my page. Uh, did I reload it? Let me try that again. OK, so let's play the video and see if it's picked up my change. So now you can see that change that I made is right away reflected in the video. And it's the player that's doing that. It's, it's WebKit that's handling all of the code to do that. The HTML at my end is really simple. So let's go back to the slides. Okay. 
So audio description, I was mentioning how audio description is helpful to people who are blind. Um, I'm gonna show you a demo that demonstrates how you can use just plain text and send it to the speech synthesis on your computer in order to render um, audio description. So normally you would have to do a video production step where you have a file that, um, you have a WAV file that you then mix in with video production and that can add a lot to both your cost and the time it takes you to produce something. But what if you could just type that out and provide it just like you provide a text transcript and rely on the screen reader on your computer to do it. So let me show you how that works. <coughs> so I'm gonna go back into Chromium. And I'm gonna go turn on Chromebox. I don't know if you were in the earlier talk on Chrome. Chromevox is the extension for Chrome uh, that we released this week, and it's, it's basically a screen reader for Chromevox. So in this case, actually, let me go show you this in the slides again. In this case, the kind is description. So when I set the kind to be description, then the player in HTML5 knows that it's not supposed to render this as text on screen, it's supposed to play it through speech. So you can see it's, again, start time, end time, and then some text. So let's go into Chromium. Okay, I've turned Chromevox on. Hopefully the sound is on. Blender, elephant's dream, tab. So that's Chromevox telling me the tab is open. And I'm gonna hit play and see what happens. So the audio description should be describing the, video, the visual elements on the screen and it should be using, doing it using the screen reader voice that's already on my computer. So let's see how that works. Oh, you know what, let me refresh my page. I bet it's not talking to Chromevox yet. One sec. Blender. Elephant's dream. Okay, now it should know that it has Chromevox. Let's try this. The Orange Open Movie Project presents. So that's audio description for my video that's been provided by a WebVTT file. And I can even go in and quickly change this. I'm gonna say the Awesome, Orange Open Movie Project okay. presents. And let's go refresh the page. Blender, Elephant's Dream. The Awesome Orange Open Movie Project presents. Cool. So that was much bit easier than having to go into the studio and record a web file and then mix it in and wait for the video to render. This is like really fast on the fly. Um, so my next example is to show you how we can do chapters uh, using kind equals chapters. In this case, when my track element in WebVTT is provided with kind equals chapters, then it knows that what it's supposed to do is use this to enable some kind of navigation. And I'm kind of hand-waving here because we haven't built the full support into WebKit yet, although we're going in this direction. What I'm going to show you today um, involves using JavaScript to do the same thing. Demos for Neo, navigation using. Okay, so imagine that we don't have a screen reader on and you're looking at this as a sighted user. You can see that there's a handy navigation pane down the side and it's got a bunch of text that tells you each of the slides that's available and what they're about and I can go click on them. And so when I click on it, it jumps directly to that part of the video. And that's done, I, my page itself is very simple. This is just done by pulling from the WebVTT file and looking at what's in, in this particular track. But for a user who's blind, we can have the same thing. Navigation using WebVTT. Demo three, HTML5 video access. So I'm just hitting Control Alt Down Arrow to, to move through the fields. And introduce in HTML5 play video button. So now I'm on the play button. I'm gonna go down one more. Title slide, press enter to navigate, space to toggle play. And so it says title slide because slide one title slide is what exists in my WebVTT file. Let me just show it to you quickly to make that really clear. And you can see it says start time, end time, title slide. And that's what my screen reader is reading out. So here, going back to title my demo slide, then, press enter to navigate. Inter it's I positioning can, of WebVTT cues, press enter to navigate, space to toggle play. 
So as a blind user, I can navigate and jump between the sections of my video um, without having to see anything that's on the screen. So I'm going to hit uh, space to play. A multimedia slide presentation is titled HTML5 Video Accessibility and the Web VTT. And what you're actually hearing there is the, the audio description that we recorded in studio. But you get the idea. I have this, this fully featured navigation um, that's implemented through WebKit and JavaScript. And in the future, this kind of support will just be baked into the player. Um, one of the stumbling blocks for us that we're still trying to figure out is how should we really represent this? What should it look like? So this navigation bar that you're seeing is sort of our, our first guess along the way in terms of what kind of implementation we might want the user interface to look like. OK, so going back to the slides. Um, very quickly, some JavaScript examples just to show how easy it is to do stuff. Um, here I'm going, and I, I have a for loop that's going and looking through the number of tracks that I have. It's picking out the ones that are subtitles, and then it chooses the one that's French, and it specifically turns on the French captions in the player. So you could do, use this within the context of a page um, to do stuff like my language selector, or you could do more complex things. And the next example shows how you can register an event handler on all of your queue changes. So anytime text appears or disappears or is enabled or disabled, you could pop up an alert, or you could do something more elaborate. But this is just a single line of code. So for the future of media on the web, we're really excited about Web VTT. And in part, we're excited about it because it's a fairly simple format. It's a simple format for somebody who's creating content to use an author. But it's also fairly simple in terms of what a browser needs to support in, able, in order to enable sort of the full range of features that are, that are available today in broadcast captions, and then go beyond it with some of the richness of the web through CSS and JavaScript. So if you're interested in more on WebVTT, if you go look on the Google Developers channel, there's a, a video in two versions, audio described and not, um, on WebVTT. And uh, we'll have links at the end of our talk. Oh, and let me close my Chromium window, or it'll be talking Positioning to Positioning of WebVTT queues, press Enter to navigate, space to toggle play. So Jess going to talk about the YouTube Captions API now. Okay. Uh, thanks, Naomi. Uh, so I wanted to talk about a topic that's specifically relevant for folks who want to add captions or interact with captions on videos that are hosted on YouTube and do that in a programmatic manner. So YouTube uh, has a larger data API, which allows you to manipulate a whole bunch of YouTube objects and get information about videos and so on and so forth. And one subset of the data API is the YouTube Captions API. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Uh, you, you could think of the YouTube Data API as a RESTful API. Uh, it's uh, a way of interacting with YouTube via HTTP requests. And it uh, has certain uh, restrictions on how you can interact with the API. There's authentication that's needed uh, in order to do uh, specifically with captions, any sort of modification and retrieval of caption tracks. You need to uh, prove that you are the video's owner uh, via one of our authentication mechanisms in order to manipulate this data. And you just also need a YouTube API developer key, which you could register for at one of the links that we provide at the end of the slide. So we support a number of different uh, formats uh, for caption data and conversions between different formats when you're requesting that data. Uh, real text, SAMI, subrip, subviewer are a few of the formats. We also su support submitting a just chunk of text, um, ideally a chunk of text that corresponds to the actual audio in your video. And uh, we'll try to auto-sync that. And uh, when you request captions, regardless of what format you uploaded the captions in, you can specify one of two different formats for getting them back. And uh, you do that using the FMT parameter in your request URL. And one format is SRT, which is subrip format, and one format is SBV, which is subviewer. Um, and we'll go into an example a little bit later that shows uh, how you can request a specific format and interact with the API in general. So I mentioned uh, that one of the options for uploading captions is using auto-synchronization. And this, in many ways, simplifies the process of adding captions. You might have a transcript of the speech in a given event 
but you don't necessarily have time codes, which are normally required um, in a caption format. You just might have it as paragraphs of text. So um, you submit that to us, and we'll run some processing on our servers and do our best to match up the speech that we hear in the video with the text that you provide for us. And um, you know this works great if there's a um, good correspondence between the text you're uploading and the person who's speaking. And we support English and Japanese as the source language for the video right now. So that's one end of things. Kind of uh, the other end of things uh, regarding speech recognition is the automatic speech recognition tracks. Uh, and th these are things that are available uh, on demand via the API if you make a request authenticated as the video owner. And what this, this track is is basically something that uses speech recognition to just analyze the speech in your video and generate a corresponding caption track. So when you're interacting with the automatic speech recognition or ASR track via the API, uh, the way you identify it uh, from you know, what might be a number of different caption tracks that are available for your YouTube video is looking for the YT derived tag. And we'll show an example that makes use of that later. But just keep that in mind. And that, that will show that that is the ASR track. And English and Japanese language are currently uh, supported for generating that track. So uh, I have a piece of demo code I, I wanted to uh, show for you guys. And before I do that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what it's going to do, obviously. So what we want to do is take in a video ID uh, corresponding to a YouTube video. This is just a unique identifier, so we know which YouTube video we're operating on. And we're going to retrieve the ASR caption track for that specific video. Uh, we're going to translate it into Pig Latin. And then we're going to upload that translation as a new caption track for that video. So what we're going to see is Python command line code. Um, it doesn't have to be Python. If you're doing interaction with the YouTube Captions API, we'll actually have an example a little bit later on that uses Java. But really, anything that could send HTTP requests can be used to interact with the Captions API. And uh, this Python command line code is actually using the new Google API Python client library for um, handling some of the authentication uh, that I mentioned is necessary. And um, that actually makes things a lot easier for me as a developer and, and you know, for you guys as well if you go out and write some code. So I, I definitely recommend that if there is a uh, client library available for the language that you're programming in, to take a look at using that because it will simplify things. And you know, again, this is a bit of a silly example, but you know, it's intended to illustrate how you could do retrieval, processing, and then re-upload of your own caption tracks. And you know, I'm sure. That, that folks have um, ideas for you know, more, meaning, more meaningful things that you could do. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's a few different steps involved here. Uh, the first thing that our code is going to do is use OAuth2 authentication to uh, request access to your YouTube accounts. And um, actually, because I'm using the Python client library, I only have to do that once, and that'll be excuse me, it'll cache my authentication token and reuse that in subsequent requests, which is great. Um, and just to clarify, it's not caching like my uh, Google account email address and password. It's just a token that gets returned from the OAuth2 service and uh, can be revoked at any time. So um, if you're writing your own code and uh, you're allowing users to authenticate for any purpose, you know, whether it's interacting with the Captions API or anything else you're doing, I, I highly recommend using something like OAuth2, which is our recommended method, uh, or AuthSub or OAuth1 uh, for doing your authentication. It's just uh, something I think your users will appreciate, not having to enter their credentials directly into your application. So that being said, once we have the authentication in place, uh, we're going to retrieve the automatic speech recognition track for the given video. Uh, and that's done by interacting with the YouTube API. Uh, then we have a little bit of logic in place in uh, the code itself for uh, pig Latinification of the different uh, text components of that track. And then once we've done that, we're going to re-upload uh, the new tr track also using the YouTube Captions API. And it should be visible. 
on YouTube. So before we get into that, I want to bring up, this is uh, our source video that we're gonna be operating on here. This is a video I took of my son rolling over for the first time. This is my first actually. day home with you. And you can see here and this is you look like you're the automatic speech recognition track that was generated for this video. So that's what we're starting with. Um, you see, there's no other um, caption tracks that are currently available. So, uh, this is the code we're gonna be using. Uh, it's available, you know, as, as part of um, just a, a whole collection of samples that interact with the YouTube API, so feel free to uh, check out the actual code. I'm not gonna go through everything here, but you know, afterwards, uh, take a look for yourself, and I'm gonna go through a few relevant sections. So the first thing um, that's important in terms of interacting with the YouTube API is this method uh, get ASR track URL. Uh, what it's gonna do is first generate a specific URL because this is a RESTful API. Uh, everything is identified via URLs and it's plugging in the video ID that's read from the command line into a you know, well-defined format for uh, the captions track. And this is something that's gonna get a list of all the captions that are available for a specific video, assuming there are any. So once we have that, sorry, once we have that URL, we're going to uh, make a HTTP request uh, pointing at that URL. And I'm just making use of the fact that the Python client library can generate um, necessary authentication headers uh, for my request. So again, this is gonna be an authenticated request. Um, otherwise, I won't get back the ASR caption track. And once I look, get the response, take a look and make sure it was a successful response. Um, I'm in my URL, I'm specifying that I'd like to retrieve the data back in JSON format, um, JavaScript object notation format, which is very easy to uh, deserialize in Python um, and then to use uh, just normal Python methods for interacting with that data. So that's what I'm doing right over here. I'm calling JSON load string body and then I'm looping through the response uh, and I'm taking a look at the di different uh, elements in the response and trying to find the specific captions track that has the YT derived tag and since I keep skipping ahead anyway, let me just show you what uh, the relevant portion of the response will look like. So, you know, it has the YT derived tag in it, and then there's a related content element that has a source um, attribute within that, and that's the URL for the specific caption track that we're looking to get. So it's kind of a two-step process. First, we have to get a list of all the caption tracks for a given video, and we loop through them. We find the specific caption track that we're looking for, and we get that corresponding URL. And that's what's going on in that code. And the next step, once we have that URL, we wanna retrieve it again. So we're making another HTTP request. Uh, this time, we're using that FMT parameter that I talked about before. Uh, so we take whatever the URL that was returned from our previous request, we add on the FMT equals SRT parameter so that we get back the captions in the SRT format. And much like before, we're making the request, we get a response back, assuming it's a successful response. We're gonna actually make use of a Python library for uh, dealing with SRT files. That makes it very easy to manipulate them. So subroot file, and we load it from the string. And uh, what gets returned from this HTTP request is really just the SRT data um, as a string. So it's very easy to load that in to this object. So the next portion of the code uh, is kind of pig Latinification. So now that we have the data available and, and loaded into memory, we can perform uh, the steps needed to turn it into pig Latin. For those not familiar with, uh, I guess, the concept of pig Latin, uh, you take the first letter of a word, and if it's a consonant, you move it to the end, and you add a Y after it. Uh, if the first letter is a vowel, then you just leave that alone, but add W, A, Y to the end. Uh, so my, my particular code does not use a very sophisticated Pig Latin algorithm. Uh, if you have any production processes that depend on like 
really rigid pig Latin completely to specification. I do not recommend that you take a look at my code and copy that. But uh, for this particular purpose, I think everything's fine. So you, you know, you, the basic idea is, you know, thank you for reading this would be hank te yu wei or fe eating re his te. So it's going to do that. It's actually looping. I'm, I'm not showing this code. That's going to loop through each of the different um, items within the overall caption track. It's going to keep uh, the time codes in place. We're not changing that, but it's just going to translate the actual text. And the final step, uh, once we've done that, we have this loaded in memory somewhere. We want to uh, push that back out to YouTube using the upload capability of the captions API. So uh, there are a few specific steps that need to be done uh, for this. You need to set a content type header in your HTTP request uh, to a specific string, which we have documented. Uh, you have to set the content language to content language header to the ISO language code of the uh, language corresponding to the caption track you're uploading. Uh, there is no ISO language code for Pig Latin for some reason, so I'm just going to use English, uh, and I have that hard-coded in my script. And there is a header called uh, slug, which represents the title of your captions track. And I have that hard coded as well. So uh, once we have those headers set up, we again create just a URL by plugging in the ID of the video. And we're going to make a post request in this case. We've previously been doing get requests because we've been retrieving data. Uh, just you know, in the RESTful APIs, when you want to create something, you normally will make a post request. So. We're doing a post request. We are setting the body of the request to be equal to the translated captions body. And we're using those headers that we defined before. So that's the relevant portions of the code. I want to show you the code in action. You don't really see too much going on here. But hopefully, this is somewhere in my history. Here we go. Um, and this is also making use of the stored credentials that I have from a previous time that I've run the code. So I have my OAuth2 credentials already uh, saved somewhere. I don't have to authenticate again. So this will run. Captions are successfully transmitted. And if I go back to this video. OK, we should be able to. Select that English pig Latin is now listed as one of the captions tracks. So I think that's selected right now. Hey, Zach. This is my first day on Yes, with you. there we go. <laughs> OK, so um, you know, it's that much more of a meaningful moment when it's in pig Latin, I, <laughs> I assure you. OK, so that's one example. Uh, here's another example. I'm not going to go through all the code for this, but I wanted to uh, just show this to you, and you could take a look at the code later, and you could actually use this uh, as something that's fully deployed to App Engine right now, and you might find it useful for your own uh, purposes. So this, this is actually an application that I wrote um, in response to uh, talking to Naomi, and Naomi, among other things, uh, is responsible for providing captions for the many, many videos that get uploaded uh, that are associated several, with Google. Several hundred <laughs> sessions from I.O. Hit the hit the hit our channel like this week. Exactly. So we I need to caption them. <laughs> yes. So we need to provide those captions for for our own videos, and uh, if you were to do that manually using the YouTube web interface, it's certainly possible, but it would take quite a bit of time. You would have to do one track at a time, more or less, and that obviously multiplies out across uh, hundreds of videos. is is quite a bit of work. It's horrible. So, Nobody should have to do that. Fair enough, and nobody has to. Um, thanks to the YouTube Captions API, we're able to automate all that. So I have this over here. Um, this is something that also will require authentication because we're going to be creating caption tracks. So first thing I'll do is add my account. Excuse me. And this is uh, using auth sub for, for authentication. It's not actually using OAuth 2, but it's something conceptually very similar. Uh, since I'm already signed in, all I have to do is click Allow Access, <clears throat> and I'll be able to grant my application the ability to upload tracks. So at this point, now that I've authenticated, it knows who I am. 
And I could select local files. Get this from the desktop. So I have three tra caption tracks here. Um, the name of the caption track is actually important. As we, uh, just as a way of saving time, we read the video ID from the name of the caption track, and we also read the language code. Um, so you'll see these all are video ID underscore language code, and if you wanted to, you could also put in the name of the caption track uh, here as well. So now that I've selected those three files, and you can select um, an arbitrary number of files, and could be for a bunch of different videos. It doesn't all have to be for the same video. We click Start Upload. And what you should see is that these caption tracks are being pushed out. It's using uh, the YouTube API. This is actually Java code running on App Engine. And uh, it's talking to the YouTube API very similar way to what we previously covered. And you get back um, actually using the channel API in App Engine. And we're getting back response from the server to our browser saying, OK, all these three things were a success. Uh, if any of these caption tracks you know, were badly formatted or there were any other errors, you know, we, we'd find out about that right away as well, and we could you know, take appropriate action. So now that that's been completed, we should be able to go back to our video, reload this one more time. And we have the caption tracks listed here. So in addition to our Pig Latin track, uh, I just uploaded English, you know, Hebrew, and Italian. This doesn't actually correspond to the text in the video, but you know, just showing you what you could do. So that's, uh, as I mentioned, available uh, just as an open source project. Take a look at the code, uh, adapt it to anything that you might find uh, you know, useful for your own project, or just use uh, the YT captions uploader.appspot.com instance uh, just for uploading captions to your videos. So uh, we're ready at this point for question and answers. Just a reminder again, uh, if you're tweeting about the session, you could use those hashtags. And if you want to provide feedback, uh, you could go to that particular link. And I, I forgot to put it on the slide. You can also email captioning at google.com. Um, so thanks, guys. Does anybody have any questions you want to ask us about any of this stuff? You could come up to the mic. Hi. 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 I have to close caption my own video. So I have to do it manually. I, I don't have, right, I am the creator of the script itself. And I've attempted to use the built-in captioning from YouTube. And it's gotten better, right? But I'd be curious of your plans about increasing the accuracy of that file. Because I'm, I work at community college, and I create a lot of video for students studying web development. But even at that level, I have to close caption it for the district requirements. So I'm curious, where, what's the state of that uh, function? Do, do you understand what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's actually there's, there's two features in YouTube. And, and I think people sometimes confuse the two, so I'll explain them both. There's auto captioning, which is pure machine-made captions. And it sounds like what you're doing is you log in as the owner, you download the machine-made caption track, you edit it, clean it up, and then you re-upload it to make good, solid, accurate captions. So that's one, one way to do it. The other way to do it is also what we're doing actually at I.O. We have the transcription in all of the keynotes that's providing right. the live streamed captions. At the end of the day yesterday, I got a bunch of text files. And I take that text file, I log into the channel, I upload it, and I use speech recognition to synchronize it. And that's an easier task for a computer, because it doesn't have to guess what all of those technical terms are. As long as it can fix a few points in there, it can align it very accurately in time. So for most of my videos, especially the technical ones, what I tend to do is I prepare a plain text transcript, and then I upload the transcript to YouTube and use the speech recognition that way. So you can use both methods. But to get back to your other question about the accuracy and will it improve, absolutely. We've improved our word error rate um, this year. We have, I, I forget the exact number. We put it in a blog post, and then I immediately forgot it. But if you go look, there's a blog post on it. One of the cool things about YouTube is, as people are uploading captions to YouTube, we can use that text in those videos to make our algorithms better. Hmm. And so over time, we hope to improve the quality, and, and we are definitely working on it. But YouTube is, is sort of a vast corpus. You have everything from people recording right. videos in their bedroom to you know, stuff like I.O. And so solving that is, is a hard and really interesting problem. Yeah. 
I, and I'm working on making, since there's nobody to ask me, behind me, mm -hmm. I hope it's okay Go I for ask it. another question, is that I've worked on making the audio quality better so that the accuracy improves because of that, because I'm a sole provider. I mean, I'm the only one. I don't have people standing there, you know, sitting there doing that. So I'm glad to hear. I knew it was, but I was just curious about what, I hadn't heard the efficiency numbers, so I'll go look for those as well, because our, you know, what we call our, our, our people that are responsible for saying, yes, we're closed caption, are looking at those numbers on ours and going, that's not good enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with them. What we do on our own videos, we, we leave the, the automatic captions on for all the videos. And actually, the owner of the channel actually has the option to turn this off. So sometimes if you see a video that's in English and you think, hey, this should have worked, why don't I have the option to transcribe audio? It may be because the owner has turned it off. Yeah. But if you're the owner and you leave it on, and we do this for all of our Google channels, we leave it on because sometimes we don't get the captions up immediately. And we mm -hmm. want to provide something in the interim that helps people to understand what has been said. But we still follow up with professionally produced caption file where we really were sure that the text is accurate because we feel like there's still too big a gap. We don't want, you know, if you're hearing and you're watching it, you can tell when there's a mistake. Right. But if you were deaf, you wouldn't know. And so we want to be sure that it's really accurate. Although we hope that, you know, in the future, we'll be able to just let it go and it'll be automated. But we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, that's the, the, the amount I have to do is the real, the real key. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? Come on up to the mic. Uh, hi. Is there any interest in a standardized hit? I mean, not only uh, Google TV and YouTube, but uh, regular TV network? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you ask it? Uh, OK. If in the future you think this is a technology that is going to rule, I mean, the regular closed captions and stuff. Uh, you mean, do I think that in the future we'll have closed captions this, on everything? This right, uh, this, this technology is going to be the one that is going to rule closed captioning. I, I think for, for a technology to be really widely adopted for closed captioning, there, there are two pieces. One, the people who are pre creating the content have to see value in the captioning. They have to want to add the captions. But the second part of it, which I think also affects the first, is how easy it is to do. And I'm really excited about some of the changes that are coming in HTML5 because I think they're make, going to make it easier and easier for anyone to add captions to their content. So whether you know, you're a big TV broadcaster, and the line between TV and the web is getting blurred, right? We have shows that we watch online, and we have shows that we watch on our television. And with Google TV, you can be watching them both at the same time. Um, I think as we move forward, we will see more and more captions on this content because it's becoming easier to do and also because our audiences are more global, more international. Thank you. This is a kind of a logistical question. Um, I work at a university and I know a lot of our professors would prefer to keep their videos hosted in the docs section of, of Google. And I know that that's powered you know, by the YouTube engine. Do the same APIs, can they be used with those videos? I am so happy you asked this question. We've only been talking about YouTube, but we actually have a product that's part of Google Apps, and it's called Video for Business. And Google Video for Business is kind of going through a transition period where we're getting ready to launch the new hotness. So right now, if you're an Apps customer and you're using video, you actually have two internal video hosting tools. You have Google Video for Business, which allows you to post captions, and you can even do the speech recognition transcript synchronization in Video for Business, and all of those are private to your domain and hosted in the cloud. The, the new hotness that's coming is basically you'll be able to just upload a video file as part of Docs. So the same way that you would upload an image file or a document and Google Docs would store it for you and share it, let you share it with people, you'll be able to upload a video and you can just play the video right there in Docs. And that video player in Docs um, needs to have captions and it needs to have an API that lets you interact with them. We're still building that out, but in the future, that's something that I think a lot of our enterprise customers are gonna need, and we're definitely focusing on it. And then my, my second question is, is there any plan, we have this great method of uploading these captions to then allow, you've put those captions up there and then automatically translate so that you don't have to go through the second step of you know, pulling your text back up and then using the API to put it back up as another language file? Um, so I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Try, try that again I'm, in a different I'm way. I'm sorry, so <laughs> is, is there any plans, if you have existing tracks, capturing tracks that you've, you've put up there, um, to automatically allow users to then 
translate them to another language. Oh, we have that now in YouTube. Um, but can if we pop you, okay. up YouTube? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you quickly. I can drive that. Pop up YouTube. So let's see, let me choose something over here. Translate captions, I believe. So in order for translate to work in YouTube, you just have to have a caption track in any language. Um, it, it probably works best if you start with English because we just have a lot more data for English. Um, mm -hmm. But you can translate to any one of 57 languages. That's how we're doing the caption gadget today. That's, it's machine translation using translate.google.com and it's built right into YouTube. And, and that's even if it's uh, captions that you've uploaded. So the user would mm -hmm. select the, your set of captions and then be able to translate using that second list that's underneath. Right, I mean Jeff's okay. example showed using the speech yeah. recognition mostly because we wanted to cram everything into one example <laughs> that people could then pull off and use it to write other code. Um, but you would, most of the time you would just use your regular English track to do that. And his example was kind of, well what if there's a language that's not in there? So that's how we added Pig Latin. Awesome. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Hi there, have you had to work with any standards that the variety of screen readers might um, have in order to read captions? So standards, you mean standards for the file format? Yeah, we, we have standards for, for producing media, and then I think there might be some standards for the screen readers to actually read things within the media. So I, I'm not, I, there may be that I'm not aware of. Um, I've, I've only really started looking at audio description recently as we've been putting more of our video on the web and realizing that we wanted to find a way to make it available to blind users. And on the web today, really the only way to do it, is, unless you have a very specialized player that you've built, is to record a WAV file and mix it into your video. And so in this case, what the screen reader is getting is it's just getting text instructions um, through the accessibility API that tells it what to read. So I, I don't know that there's a specialized format. I mean, it has to be a format that's compatible with your browser. I guess, but it, it's actually pretty simple. Good, I, I think that's the overall problem is that there are so many choices for you know, between JAWS and Windows Eyes, things like that, that can be OS level or even specific like Chromebox. And yeah, if, I mean, if, you yeah. as the content creator or the, the page creator or the video hoster, you shouldn't have to worry about any of that. Your browser should know how to do it for you. Good, thanks. Okay, anybody else or should we let the hordes in for the next talk? <laughs> Let's let the hordes in, thank you so much. Thank you.